This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is available at www.philosophybites.com. Philosophy Bites is made in association with the Institute of Philosophy. There's a tradition in philosophy, which started in Oxford post-World War II, that insists that to understand mental concepts like belief or free will or memory or desire, we just need to analyse how the concepts are actually used in everyday language. Some people refer to the set of commonly held views about these psychological states as folk psychology. Pat Churchland, who's based at the University of San Diego, is a well-known and contentious critic of folk psychology. With her husband, Paul, she works on the relationship between neuroscience and philosophy. She says that we can't approach folk psychology uncritically. Folk psychology can be wrong. As we learn more and more about the brain, we'll need to modify some of our concepts and even eliminate them. Pat Churchland, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Thanks, it's a pleasure to be here. The topic we're going to talk about today is eliminative materialism. Now, to somebody outside philosophy, that's just gobbledygook. What is it? Okay, the idea of eliminative materialism is really quite simple. When Paul and I were thinking about the nature of mental states and how they relate to brain states, we were motivated to look at the history of science. And one of the things that you can see in the history of science is that there is a kind of progression, and you see it in chemistry and physics and biology, whereby certain old concepts get replaced by new developments in science. And so, for example, in the context of Newtonian physics, the old idea of impetus got thrown out. So one of the questions that we wanted to ask was this. As neurobiology comes to interleave with higher level concepts, what will those higher level concepts look like? Will they look like folk psychology as it has been since ever, or will there be fundamental changes? We made a prediction. Our prediction was that there's likely to be change, and in that sense, we were talking about elimination. So the eliminative bit is the idea that you get rid of something. The materialist bit is the bit that the brain is a physical thing, and that's basically what we as thinking beings are, physical things. Yes, the materialism part of the story is certainly not new with us, the hypothesis that all mental states, including states of consciousness, thoughts, ideas, beliefs, desires, motivations, they are all states of the physical brain. As an hypothesis, this has increasingly been supported by developments in neuroscience, so that right now there's very little evidence for the view that there is a non-physical substance, a kind of spooky thing or ethereal thing that does the thinking and the feeling and the remembering and so forth, that looks like these are all part of the physical brain itself. So that's the materialist part of the story. And as you say, the eliminativist part of the story was a prediction, a prediction that certain concepts might be modified, developed, might even be eliminated as neuroscience progressed. So what is a, an example of a concept of folk psychology? The concepts that we use in everyday explanations of ourselves and of others, concepts having to do with beliefs, desires, intentions. I think the notion of having a goal is part of folk psychology, but I think that's one of the concepts that's likely to be retained as a high-level psychological concept that really does fit quite well with neurobiological findings. Other concepts, such as the notion of will, I mean, there certainly is something that's different in somebody who we describe as having strong will and somebody who we describe as being weak-willed, but there isn't a thing in there that is the will. What there is is a whole lot of circuitry, poorly understood at this point, that in various ways regulates decision-making, but Will is sometimes thought of as comparable to a muscle. There's nothing in there that's like a muscle. So in the case of memory, for example, prior to about 1950, people generally thought of memory as a kind of single unified function. 
Well, we know now that there are different parts of the nervous system that handle quite different functions that used to be called memory. Remembering how to ride a bicycle is a very different function and relies on quite different circuitry than remembering your mother's name. It turns out that the concept of memory actually fractionates into many different subtypes, each of which is regulated by rather different pathways. Is this a bit like the way in which the concept melancholy has changed. I mean, for Elizabethans, the concept of melancholy was quite different from our concept of depression. It could be quite a creative malady. It had certain causes in the levels of bile or whatever explanations that were given. And now we've more or less eliminated that concept of melancholy and have a different, more medical concept of depression. I think it is rather similar to that. Another example would be the notion of demonic possession. In our culture, we forget how recent was the idea of demonic possession, but it's important to remember that something like Huntington's disease, in which there is a decline of regulation of motor function as well as cognitive function, and people make all kinds of movements that they don't, as it were, intend, used to be thought of as demonic possession. So if you like, that's an example of outright elimination as opposed to modification. You've got this hypothesis that various folk psychological concepts will be eliminated as neuropsychology and neurobiology progresses. What does that mean for philosophy? Because there are some styles of doing philosophy where people sit in an armchair and reflect on the concepts that they happen to have. Are they misguided in doing that? Well, conceptual analysis, which has had its heyday in Oxford really from, let us say, about the mid-50s onwards, had this idea that you could find out about the nature of something merely by reflecting in your own mind about the relationships between various concepts so that you could, as it were, do it all in a certain a priori way. Quine, an American philosopher, Willard Van Orman Quine, asked the question, well, it's very useful on some occasions to reflect on the meaning of your concepts, but the more important question for asking about the nature of things is whether those concepts truly apply to the phenomenon in question. And that is what I'm interested in. I'm not so interested in how people talk about the phenomenon. I really want to know whether those concepts truly apply. So when it comes to understanding perception, decision-making and choice, what it is to be a self and to be conscious, I want to know not about what you might mean by those things, although that can be interesting. I want to know whether those concepts, rough and ready as they are, apply to the phenomenon in question. I want to know about the nature of things. And this is a very old philosophical preoccupation. I feel that I would have had a lot in common with Aristotle, with John Locke, who after all, heaven forbid, did dissections, with David Hume, Increasingly, I think philosophers are sensitive to the fact that if they want to understand something such as perception, that they need to pay attention to both psychological and neurophysiological results of perception. I mean, here's a really interesting fact. Very, very early in visual cortex, that is in the first area in visual cortex to which visual signals are sent, there is valuation because there are projections from higher areas of the brain all the way back to V1 that attach a value signal to this perceptual signal rather than that one. And so when philosophers say, but you must separate fact and value, it's an interesting feature of the brain that before we're even conscious of a visual perception, it comes with a valence. So you're saying babies actually, in the act of perception, are at the same time preferring one thing to another. That's the valuation. They attach some kind of qualitative aspect to this, even though they may not be aware of it themselves. Absolutely. And learning and being rewarded by interacting with a particular stimulus, the mother, the breast, means that when the baby has a certain smell or a certain visual perception, 
that already comes to the baby's conscious awareness as having a pro value. So the separation of fact and value is something that is highly sophisticated, comes really quite late in life, and we have to be taught it. And this is a very important thing, especially in thinking about morality, where philosophers are wont to begin with the idea that the system has facts, and then value has to come from something else, namely rules. If you look at the nervous system, it doesn't look like that. Does this mean that philosophers have to be scientists? I think there is a very particular role for philosophers. It's not to just, as we used to say in San Diego, pull it out of your ass. It is to connect in a very meaningful way with the range of data that is relevant to your question. So the one way I think of a job for a philosopher is analogous to the role of theoretical physicists, who don't themselves necessarily engage in experiments, but who draw upon a very broad range of experiments to try to get a coherent hypothesis about how something works. And I think you might say the same thing about certain kinds of philosophical questions, questions about decision-making and choice. It's no good just sitting in your office thinking about it. What you need to do is find out what do we know about discounting of values in the future? What do we know about the role of motivation and choice, about attention, about valuation and perception that makes decision-making look the way it is? And that means instead of having this scientific enterprise, which is largely vertical, the philosopher can have a scientific program which is horizontal and goes across many labs, across many projects, across many subdisciplines to try to synthesize and put it together in a useful way. Now the hypothesis you come out with has to be testable. It's not very interesting if it's true by definition. And sometimes you're going to get it wrong. And when you get it wrong, what you're going to say is not but this is my position which I defend. What you say is, okay, let's modify it in light of the data. Just if we took that example of decision making, you can find out all these facts about how people make decisions and some of the hypotheses scientifically about how decisions are actually instantiated in the brain. What's the role for a philosopher in this whole world of understanding decisions? One of the things we would particularly like to understand is how it is that one desire can be given free reign and the other suppressed. You can, if you just reflect in your own mind, say, well, I do it by exercising my will. But we want to know really how that happens. Relative to the data that are existing now, you could frame a hypothesis about how that happens. What you'd have to do is draw very broadly on it, and you have to talk about it in terms of pathways and interactions and so forth. You would develop a computational model, which may or may not turn out to be true. There is a sense in which we need these concepts, the folk psychology concepts of our age, to talk about our relationships with other people, because we're stuck with these, we're brought up with these concepts. We're not going to jettison them just because somebody makes a discovery in neuroscience. No, that's quite true. Let me make two points, but let me frame those points by saying something about what I mean by a high-level concept. Having a goal, for example, is a high-level concept, and we think that that can be instantiated in a very specific way in circuitry in the brain stem and the limbic system. So the high-level description means the sort of related to behavior description, and the low-level description would be in terms of neural activity. Now, there's no question that we need high-level concepts. We need to have concepts like X has a goal, or X is maintaining his goal despite distractions. We say that with regard to rats and mice and babies. The other point really is that there's no question that the high-level concepts that we use from folk psychology will be replaced until we have a good science to replace them with. And so a concept like trust and attachment turns out to be extremely important 
in describing the behavior not only of humans with regard to their offspring and with regard to their mates and their friends, but also at the level of rats and monkeys and baboons and chimpanzees. And we also know now something about the circuitry and the neurochemicals that regulate that behavior. So trust is a high-level concept, and it may get refined and revised as we know yet more, but it's a high-level concept that meshes very beautifully with what we know at the physiological level. Now, there are certain other concepts where we don't know how it's going to work out. Concepts like beliefs are problematic because some beliefs are things that are kind of forefront in our minds as a sentence, like, I believe you're wearing a pair of glasses. Others are kind of in the background of our knowledge, and they're not stored in the brain as sentences. Of that, we can be sure. So how to characterize them remains puzzling. Whether as it were, people in general adopt a new vocabulary depends on how useful it is for them. So it's never part of our agenda to say, you know, people must change. I mean, you know, we're just little Canadians. We're very easygoing. But what we want to know is how things really are. I was just thinking when you were saying that of the way that people use the phrase left brain and right brain now. Mm. It's very crude, but it, it's a way of understanding patterns of behavior, which yeah. would have been completely alien 50 years ago. I think that's right. The idea of being frontal is now really becoming very common, so that when someone shows a tendency to be poor in impulse control, to be poor in maintaining a goal, to be easily persuadable by rather goofy ideas, they're often spoken of as being frontal. And that's because within the neurological domain, frontality, that is frank lesions within frontal structures, is associated with that kind of dysfunction. Now, I know when you first wrote about eliminative materialism, you got some quite strong reactions. This is a radical hypothesis, and it annoyed some people. Well, we thought the hypothesis wasn't radical at all. We thought, isn't it obvious that folk psychology, this sort of ancient, bumbling, in many ways incoherent, in many ways inconsistent, but beloved thing, will change? But... I think there was a certain willful misunderstanding on the part of philosophers. Some philosophers were terrified by the idea that the science itself of psychology, neuroscience, economics, and so forth were going to have to play a role, and that they needed to think about hypotheses as opposed to a priori truths. They would need to know something about science. And so... We were caricatured as supposing that beliefs were nothing other than the firing of neurons in the basal ganglia or something. And I think we were largely written off. We were Americans. We didn't speak the fancy English that people did in Oxford. Um, I don't really know what the explanation was, but clearly we were written off. And there were occasions when I would give a talk and someone in the question period would stand up and very aggressively say, you're not doing philosophy anymore. Why are you even here? Why are you even speaking at, claiming to be a philosopher, yada, yada, yada. yada. And uh, we just got used to it. And we don't care that much. What I'm interested in is finding things out. And if there are people who would rather just sit and talk about what they think rationality is without knowing anything, far be it from me to complain. Pat Churchland, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And you can hear more Philosophy Bites at www.philosophybites.com. Philosophy Bites is made in association with the Institute of Philosophy. For more information about the Institute, go to www.philosophy.com. Dot sas.ac.uk dot dot